Hey, hello everybody. How are you? Hello. Good How's afternoon. Let's see. Oh, we got ooh, we got five participants. It's good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. How are you? Okay, I just realized that you can't say anything back to me, so I'm gonna stop with the <laughs> throw it in the chat how you're doing today. How about that? How's that sound? Yes. The, these are always this, uh, this first moment of a webinar where we know there are people listening to us, but they unfortunately cannot say anything back to us, but we just want to make sure everybody is very, very welcomed here. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Uh, to answer Carrie's first question in the chat. Uh, sorry, so I have like three computer screens. I've never done a presentation <laughs> with multiple screens, so probably going to be staring back and forth. Uh, Carrie's first question was, uh, how are you both doing? I'm doing pretty well. Coincidentally, it's my birthday. So feeling pretty Happy good about birthday. today. Happy birthday, Dan. Thank you. It's, yeah, it's a big day. It's a big oh. day. Well, thank you, everybody. And in the chat, they're also saying happy birthday. So, uh, so we're going to give a couple more minutes just for people to join, um, you know, just in case we got any late minute. Oh, Margo's in. So Margo uh, is actually going to be, uh, we're going to have a couple clips from Margo. So everybody say hi, Margo. Hi, Margo. Uh, Margo is uh, our long time um, our guest at the History Center. We always appreciate her coming and uh, I'm, yes, hi, Margo. Uh, and I'm really happy that today we're actually gonna um, get to present two clips from Margot's interview. That is a fascinating story. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, we don't have a whole day to play the entire interview, but it is available in our collection. Yeah, as all the other interviews that you're gonna hear today. Yeah, it's uh, it's a little sad. We only you know we have an hour, uh, and um, you know we could do. 30, 40 hours of, of content that we have, just playing these people who lived through this like incredibly tumultuous time. Uh, you know, it would be amazing to do that. Obviously it would be a rather time consuming program that was for everybody. But, um, so we've got about 22 people. I'm gonna give it like another minute, but we're just gonna introduce ourselves. Uh, yeah, so oh, I think it's a good time to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so I'm Daniel Bradfield. Uh, I got my MA in history from the, from UCF. Uh, primarily, my focus was on the Soviet Union during World War II, so it's not necessarily related to my job here, but, you know, it's always been a little bit of a research interest of mine. Um, and with me is? I am Aleksandra Cicelong Flodo, and uh, I am originally from Poland, moved here five years ago, got my PhD in social science, and uh, so if you're gonna hear about Poland today more than you were expecting to hear, this is all on me. <laughs> I've uh, been working uh, with oral histories for over 10 years now, and my previous experience is actually working with um, Holocaust and World War II survivors uh, over in, in Europe. So Poland, uh, Israel, did some research in Hungary, uh, Germany before I moved here. Okay, well, now I feel like I have to completely flush out my biography since Alexandra no, I'm... added more to hers. I worked for UCF's Veterans History Project, uh, which wasn't exclusively World War II vets, but we kind of prioritized as much as we could World War II vets and Korean vets because with the passage of time, those are the oldest uh, generation of veterans that we have. So trying to collect those as fast as we can. So today for our program, we're going to talk about World War II through its witnesses. Obviously, we're the Orange County Regional History Center, so we're going to kind of prioritize Central Florida in that discussion. Um, but we're going to start off with a very brief overview of the war, which Alexandra will start us off with. Yes, I think, I think we can already start. Um, so I promise it's going to be very short uh, because it's a such a wide topic, but uh, we kind of wanted to give a brief introduction to um, origins and the beginning of World War II, all the way up to uh, December 41 when um, Pearl Harbor happened, when uh, United States entered the war. So 1930s were really turbulent times all over the world. 
um, even though World War One just ended, and in some countries, including Poland, for example, uh, you could feel, you know, the the joy of getting independence back. Uh, countries were rebuilding. It doesn't really change the fact that Europe was really destabilized at that time, and World War One uh, left uh, Europe with a huge social economical problems. So throughout the entire twenty twenties and thirties, we saw a lot of conflicts. Um, all over the place. Uh, also in Asia, we have Japanese invasion on Manjuria, 31. Um, Which some people cite as the start of World War II uh, in like at least the Asian theater, but real uh, serious Japanese invasion of the country didn't start until around the same time that Germany was annexing countries in Europe. So it really starts to heat up in the late 30s. Yeah, it's, also it's, in the Pacific. it's getting really, really tense at that time. Mm -hmm. We have the civil war in Spain. We have mm -hmm. uh, conflict in Africa. Uh, and then it's all slowly leading to um, the big events of the late 1930s. So we have the Anschluss, the German annexation of Austria in 38. It's followed by Sudetenland, uh, annexation of Sudetenland. So part of Czechoslovakia, October 38. And then the big uh, official start of World War II, September 1st, 1939, German invasion of Poland. Uh, it's followed by UK and France declaring war on Germany, September 3rd. It's mostly because UK had just signed an agreement with Poland in March that in case of German invasion, they're gonna declare a war. Military-wise, nothing happened at that time. Uh, they didn't really send any troops to help Poland. However, you know, officially, France, UK, uh, Poland, Germany were at war. Then September 17th, we have Soviet invasion on Poland. This is why I put this little map in here, because uh, Germany and Soviet Union basically split Poland in half. And at that time, uh, because they had just signed an agreement, a pact, uh, ribbentrop molotov pact in August, they were not at war at this time. So Germany continued their invasion in the West, uh, Soviet Union continued their invasion in the East. So we have a, a winter war, so Soviet attack on Finland in November, and then Germany, um, you know, goes farther. We have fall of France in 1940, Italy enters the war, and then finally, June 41, Germany decides, nope, we're not gonna honor the pact. We are going to create an Eastern Front. We're going to attack Soviet Union. So uh, June 1941, um, this uh, happens. And this is pretty much how Europe looked like at the moment when uh, Pearl Harbor happens and when United States joins uh, the war. It was already pretty much divided between two big powers. A very, very sad map to look at. Um, and yeah, this is this is uh, this is 1941. So yeah, yeah, extremely fall of 41 is an extremely precarious position for the globe to be in. Uh, at a, as you can see, like it, in along here. Uh, Nazi forces are, uh, well, Nazi and allied forces are not far uh, from Moscow. They're only 80 or 90 miles. And the geography of the Soviet Union is that east of Moscow is basically steppe. Uh, the vast majority of the population of the Soviet Union lived west of Moscow, uh, and about half of the Soviet population would be under German occupation until liberations in the in 43 and 44. So. At the time when the U.S. joins the war, it's an extremely precarious position, not only in Europe, but also in the Pacific Front, because uh, you can see large-scale occupations of Japanese forces in Manchuria, uh, taking over Korea, Indochina, which is uh, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, uh, attacks in Australia. Um, so what we have here is our first clip. This is a story from Cranston Rogers, an interviewee from 19, oh. Um, just going. from Sorry, from 2019. Uh, he's discussing his story about Pearl Harbor. Oh, nope. Then it Son of a, okay. Sorry, sorry. Starting again. Um, just going back, do you remember how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I was with my grandfather that oh, day. Okay. I was dry 
driving with him from Orlando over to someplace south of Melbourne, Vero Beach maybe, I'm not familiar now, so I've been, that's where he had to take some pictures that day. Mm -hmm. And as usual, I went to help him because he had to set up the bleachers to take a group picture. Mm -hmm. He drove over, but I drove back. Mm -hmm. And on the way back, I went, I snoozed just briefly and but jerked the car back on the road. We were in the stretch in the section where it's over the swamp mm -hmm. between uh, the East Coast and, and uh, Orlando where the road is built up on a, on a fill section. And But I discovered that I had dropped off and I jerked the car back and uh, but the car, when it stopped, rolled over. I, I, in, in the process of bringing the car back perpendicular to the road, hmm. it simply rolled over. It was about a 19, well, it was a 10-year-old car with an outside running board. And the only damage to the car, my grandfather was sleeping in the back seat was that we bent the the the, uh, the running board on the right side of the vehicle mm -hmm. when it turned over. But otherwise, the car was in great shape. And he made me get back in the car and, and continue to drive back. He was OK. But then we learned that the Japs had attacked Pearl Harbor. And that was Sunday afternoon of December 7th mm -hmm. of oh, 1941, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. And anyway, um, uh, all right, wait a minute now. What, what? <laughs> no, I asked how I you'd heard about uh, Pearl Harbor, so that was... That was it. Oh, so we turned the radio on and found out that the that, that Japs had attacked Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, he he had uh, told me to get back in the car and drive, and uh, we we drove back to Boston. And everybody was fine, mm -hmm. and that that was, but. Uh, uh, the only consequence of that was I had to register for the draft when I turned 18, and that wouldn't be for two more years. So uh, that was Cranston Rogers from 2019, uh, a local veteran. Uh, he so in that clip, it's uh, it shows kind of a salient and important thing to remember about oral history. We don't necessarily know how someone's personal life interjects themselves into historical events. So Cranston's telling like a very clear story. He was he heard it on the car radio that there uh, that the attack in Pearl Harbor was there, but it's also very intermingled with the story of the car accident. Uh, you know, this is a very important day, and the two are kind of interchanged uh, and intermingled in his mind. Um, so we're going to hear another thing from him him a little later as well. Um, so immediately after Pearl Harbor, the U.S. declared war on Japan. In accordance with the alliance between the powers, Germany declared war on the U.S., who subsequently declared it back as well. In the early months of the war, the United States began supplying its new allies with weapons, food, and gasoline. With this new threat, Japan launched Operation Drumbeat in January 1942. That campaign used U-boats and successfully destroyed 24 American ships off of the Atlantic and Gulf coasts. In this clip, Dorothy Segul, uh, a local woman, talks about her husband's wartime service, both in anti-submarine warfare and as a flight instructor for civilian pilots. Then uh, the war was getting pretty bad, and there were submarines along the Atlantic coast, along Daytona Beach, and all up and down the Atlantic coast. They were they were sighted out there. So Civil Air Patrol uh, asked him and a number of others to go into active duty and fly these small aircraft up and down the coast, and they would have live bombs under them. Looking, they, they would go 
slow enough so that they could actually see the submarines down below. Because in order for the submarines to see anything uh, on land, they had to be up fairly close to the surface. And they actually did, did uh, uh, find a couple and, uh, and explode their bombs and blow them up. So that he would um, fly those slow-moving planes from about uh, Melbourne up to Brunswick, Georgia, I believe. But uh, it was very effective. But about that time, then they, uh, the war was continuing to uh, progress and accelerate, and he was asked to be, or he was given the opportunity to be um, a flight instructor, civilian again, flight instructor over in Ocala. And he taught the, the uh, young men in the Air Force the primary phase of flying, which was the, the um, acrobatics that would teach them how to dogfight. You know, the dog fights in order to hit the enemy and and beat and then run and so forth with with their uh, so that uh, when he went up there to Ocala, I of course missed him and he uh, but he would come to Orlando to see me um, several times a week. But uh, we decided to get married. Uh, so. World War II brought enormous federal spending into Florida. Uh, in 1940, only $9 billion were spent of federal dollars in Florida. But by 1945, $98.5 billion were spent by the federal government in Florida. By the end of the war, Florida housed 172 military installations with the gigantic Camp Landing and Naval Air Station Jacksonville being among the most notable. Camp Landing at a certain point during the war became the fourth largest city in Florida. So an absolutely enormous uh, part of central of, of Florida. Uh, camp Landing's up by Stark, so a little bit outside of our collecting area. Um, in central Florida, Orlando Air Base and Pine Castle Air Force Base uh, would train pilots, provide air support for the submarine warfare as seen in the previous slide, and perform training bombing runs in uh, certain designated unpopulated sections of Central Florida swamps. In this clip, Edward Burtz describes what Orlando Air Force Base and Pine Castle Air Force Base looked like during the looked like from the air during the war. How it was used here mm -hmm. as a war theater. This is what we call the Army Air Force School of Applied Tactics War Theater, and it shows a picture of the state of Florida with Orlando Air Force Base which was headquarters for AFSAT, mm -hmm. and you had your satellite bases around, which was down here at Pine Castle, mm -hmm. then you had fighters down there, and over here you had uh, fighters at Lakeland, mm -hmm. you had some down here at St. Petersburg, and MacDill over at Tampa had B-17s. Mm -hmm. And what we would do, we'd take off, and the B-17s would join up, just like they were going to do over in England when they got over there. That's what this was, a school for applied tactics to get ready to go into combat over in England or either over in the Pacific, whichever way they have to be going. And what the B-17s, the, the bombers would do, they would form up, and then the fighters would scramble from uh, up here. And uh, see, so we had some up at Perry, Florida. We had some, uh, it's on the map, it's hard to read here. But anyway, the fighters, the P-51s, most of the P-51s, and earlier we had P-40s and P-39s, but the P-51s came in later for the long-range job. Mm -hmm. uh, support of the, of the bombers, and they would take off and join up, and they would fly a mission just like they were flying over to Berlin and, and back, and the fighters would escort them all the way. So this school here in Orlando was preparing the boys for combat, for going into combat. Mm -hmm. And the first time I flew into Orlando Air Force Base here, they had the runways all camouflaged, and they had orange groves painted on them, and I came in and I asked them for landing information, and uh, they said, uh, don't you see the field? And I said, no, I don't have any sight. And they said, well, do you see a B-17, which was a bomber, mm -hmm. in uh, a lake down there? And I saw this B-17, they had it mounted on concrete blocks. And it's in Lake Su it was in Lake Suzanne, which is right on the Orlando Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And they used it for ditching for the crews. To, a B-17 had 10 men in it. So they had this B-17 in the, on concrete box in the lake. Mm -hmm. And just like they'd ring the bell, just like they were ditching in the ocean, and the men would all assume that crash positions, and then they would ring the bell again when it hit the water, and they would all show, each one had to evacuate out of the airplane, and that's the way they practiced to, to get out uh -huh. of the airplane. So this was one busy place here during the war. It was a wonderful training place for them. All throughout the nation, uh, Americans worked to support the war effort, whether it was a parachute sewing company or the Pine Castle boat and construction company. 
The Pine Castle Boat, uh, Boat Company, now named Correct Craft, built badly needed amphibious landing vehicles to cross the Rhine River near the end of World War II in Europe. Um, so I'm just quoting a little bit here from a, an article about it. Um, although only scheduled to make 48 boats that month, the company agreed to produce 300. This was at the direction of General Dwight D. Eisenhower. It was a slow start. Only 62 boats were built in the first six days, but after securing a new machine and making other changes at the suggestion of Wolf Maloon, the company hit its quota ahead of time. Uh, their final pace was 42 boats a day being built by employees. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of that, but it's such a cool local story that I feel like I have to include it. Uh, while work was being done in Central Florida to support the war effort, Cranston Rogers, who we had played a little bit earlier from Pearl Harbor, uh, relays his service outside of Dachau towards the end of World War II in Europe. Well, they needed experience. I had the experience as a platoon leader. Oh, okay, sorry, just trying to turn that up, but never mind. Okay, all right, I'm just gonna stop trying to turn it up and just play it. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Well, they needed experience. I had the experience as a platoon leader, and my company commander was very confident. And I, uh, well, later, I, uh, between Nuremberg, well, in, uh, um, in, um, in um, Munich, before we went into Munich, we went into Dachau. Okay. And uh, I happened to be assigned all the civilian houses on the east side of Dachau. And then a whole, I found that hiding in virtually every civilian house, instead of German soldiers, there were uh, inmates that had escaped Dachau mm -hmm. and were really friends. But they spoke a foreign language and didn't know that we were treating them as friends. And I had to urge them. Of course, it was a language problem, but um, particularly because some of the inmates that had escaped were were Jer uh, Dutchmen. Mm. They none, none of us knew how to speak Dutch, but it was a variation of German, so uh, we could communicate. But the point was that. Um, I was treating them as friends and 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 uh, trying to help them uh, because they had escaped from the concentration camp mm -hmm. and were simply hiding. And I was I was in I was trying to bring them to a safe place as to where they could uh, be taken care of because oh. Uh, uh, we had to get them to medical treatment. Um, they all were starving, and they needed medical treatment and, and uh, protection against starvation. In other words, not, not gobble up a lot of food, but they needed medical help. Mm -hmm. And that's what my men had to <coughs> lead them to. And then the a couple of days later, we, we did go back to Dachau, but my my biggest problem in, in uh, Munich after we got there was the, the uh, Russian soldiers did not want uh, Russian soldiers that had been held in PW camps mm -hmm. would not go back to Russia because the Russians would mistreat them because they were captured mm -hmm. and they didn't want to go back to Russia because of that but they became a hindrance to the because they would they, mainly Russian soldiers would take over German homes and throw the Germans out and treat them pretty badly mm -hmm. uh, we had to arrest them and, and take them to prisoner camps so they could be properly expatriated and we had war we had our greatest problem after right after the war particularly in the Munich area where ex-russian pws it, it's 
I find that quote clip really interesting because uh, you know the the difficulties of policing after the war is not necessarily something that we think a lot about, and this also um, you know cross cultural uh, kind of uh, interaction that you see uh, immediately after the war. You know, he's talking about how to deal with Dutch AIDS patriots, uh, Soviet POWs, and the local German population who all probably hate each other. Um, and how do you deal with this amalgam of languages and the extreme difficulty of uh, these, you know, how to kind of thread the needle between those extremely disparate peoples? It's just a very, very, very interesting clip, I think. Um, so in addition to Florida's industrial production, uh, citrus, a key industry that we like to talk about all the time, but then somehow still not enough, uh, provided a key food to help Britons during the Blitz and blockade uh, by German U-boats. Initially, citrus was dehydrated and then shipped to the front, but later Floridians perfected a better tasting for frozen concentrate. Florida's citrus production uh, surpassed California's for the first time in 1942-43. Also, DDT was created uh, in the Bureau of Entomology in Orlando. Um, this newly purchased Mount Dora postcard reflects that situation where this citrus packing house, uh, the Wayside Packing House, um, is saying that they won't have anything available for domestic sale again due to the war effort. Uh, this is a newly acquired artifact. We scanned it and showed it today. Our uh, chief curator, Pam, purchased it recently. Oh, and uh, somebody in the chat, also a Mount Dora resident. That's incredible. So for this clip, um, World War II saw labor shortages throughout the United States. Um, the mass draft needed to fight the war uh, caused a real strain on labor shortages locally um, and throughout the US. Uh, to deal with that, that's where you come up with uh, Rosie the Riveter and with other, um, you know, women entering the workforce and those kind of things. But one of the things also to use that to, to meet that demand, we used uh, German POWs. Uh, while the majority worked outside of our region in Camp Landing and Camp Johnson in the Panhandle, an unknown number of the 10,000 POWs worked in Orlando, Winter Haven, Melbourne, and along the Banana River. Uh, they worked packing citrus cutting down sugarcane, a new industry that was needed once the Japanese occupied the Philippines, uh, clearing forests and planting new crops, apparently potatoes, uh, interestingly. Um, so in this clip, John Barnes describes how he became a military policeman assigned to oversee POW camps in Florida. So one thing just to, to say out loud, we transcribed this one because these are old uh, cassette oral histories. They can be really difficult to hear. Um, so we're hoping that this version is good, plus you can follow it along with the transcript as well, so. They sent me to hospital and reclassified me into a limited duty. And it was February 28, 1943. And uh, they picked me up from the hospital by Jeep, took me to military police detachment where I went to the orderly room and saw the first sergeant and told me at the time that, that I was going to be sent down to uh, the post prison or stockade number one where they kept American prisoners. They also had a uh, prisoner war camp there. And uh, they were having trouble segregating the, the Nazi type Germans from the regular German soldiers. We had a, a prison officer that was a an older man that had been. Uh, he was a reserve officer from World War One, and they they called him back to duty, and he was our prison officer. He was a captain, and but he was a very uh, very patriotic gentleman, Southern general from South Carolina. And uh, but he was a very good uh, disciplinarian without being cruel. And uh, so they sent him over to take care of, they were having these problems. 
with the uh, general prisoners of war, so they sent him over there to try and straighten it out, which he did. He immediately segregated the Nazi types from the uh, non-Nazi types. Mm -hmm. So this also is a good example of, at times, the maddening part of oral history. Uh, like, I'm sure you listening as well as me at home, or me as well as you at home listening, want to know details, you know? What were the problems between these, you know, ideological Nazi soldiers and the non-Nazi types, you know? Um, what were their work conditions like? What, how did you interact with them? But that's the problem. This is recorded, it's already done, there's no follow-up questions that can be done 20 years later. So both the beauty and kind of the maddening part about oral history. Um, so on August 14th, news of Japanese surrender spread throughout the United States. Uh, I'm gonna read here from uh, Bacon's Orlando, a, Sentinel, a centennial history. Um, sirens announced the victory and a huge parade formed at 2 p.m. Crowds roamed the street, venting their joy by singing, shouting, and all forms of noise making. The crowd gathered at South Orange Avenue singing, glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. All business houses closed except restaurants. Long distance telephone calls initiated through the Orlando office broke all records, about 4,000 an hour or an estimated 35,000 for the day. All civilian employees at the airbase were given a two-day holiday. Civic clubs canceled their meetings. Gas rationing was lifted, and cars jammed Orlando streets. So, as you can see from the left, that is a parade that was held to celebrate the end of rationing and the return of consumer goods. On the right is uh, Pinky, um, an absolutely beloved local dog that appeared in multiple war bond uh, drives um, throughout the war. Just we at the office uh, can't get enough of dogs. So we <laughs> try to show them. Then, and yeah. she's loved now by all the staff yes. here. <laughs> we yes. love to R present Pinky to the world. Yeah, RIP Pinky, but uh, just an absolutely wonderful creature. Um, so while citizens were parading across the cities, soldiers would um, begin occupations of uh, liberated countries and occupations of former uh, Axis powers. They would begin rebuilding cities and would um, construct and then man refugee resettlement programs. So it, here we have Virgil Marchand um, and he will be discussing uh, the end of the war. Oh no, when they dropped the bomb on Japan. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, 1945, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, that was one of our guard duties we had. Uh -huh. I was guarding the Red Cross uh -huh. warehouse. Mm -hmm alongside the, the canal where Manel Bay is. And all of a sudden, the, the uh, ship started blasting. Mm. And I, you know, I was, I was amazed to see what uh, was that doing it like that. <clears throat> and then they come over the word that they bombed Pearl Harbor and they surrendered, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, like I say, an infantry man in the garden uh, was, was around his hand, didn't know what to shoot, uh -huh. didn't know what to do, you know, until he got the information that, uh, they had dropped that bomb on. Uh -huh. was yeah. Was there a big party? Well, it wasn't too much of a party in late at night, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the next day or... Well, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, lot of... So you probably noticed as well that in there, uh, Mr. Marchand says Pearl Harbor. Um, and that happens sometimes, you know. People make small errors when they're talking. They say 1942 or... 1924 or something, you get the numbers messed up in their head, they get their dates mixed up, it just happens sometimes. And that's just the nature of when you record that speech. Uh, these are you know, not planned speeches, so people make these kind of small errors. In the previous section, he had been talking about Pearl Harbor. So that was probably immediately salient on his mind, and he just said it instead of either Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So just an important thing to remember, another little picadillo uh, of oral history specifically. Oh, I forgot the quote part. I'm so sorry. Anyway, this is the transcript of the quote. I apologize. Oh, no. Uh, so that is some of the older collection that we have. Uh, our oral history collection has about 900 interviews. Uh, the majority of those are cassette tapes that need to be digi digitized. You listen to a very small section of the digitized portion. Um, we have over 300 digital interviews that we've done 
Our World War collection has uh, over 30 American veterans. Uh, and kind of the beauty of Central Florida specifically um, is that the own, we have more stories than just American veterans. So now we're going to transition to immigrants who came from other parts of the world and brought with them World War II stories. So I'm going to be passing over to Alexandra. Okay. Yes. So um, here we come to our first uh, story. Uh, Mrs. Malgojata Kovacic Wright. Uh, Margo. Hey again. I know Margo is over there. Um, so uh, Mrs. Wright was born in Krakow, Poland, uh, and right before the war, uh, the family moved to Cheshen. Uh, Cheshen is a very interesting place itself. It's right at the border between Poland and uh, Czechia right now, at that time Czechoslovakia. Uh, historically, it's been on and off in Poland, Germany, Prussia, uh, Czechoslovakia. It's a very diverse uh, city, culturally, ethnically. Um, so it's also interesting how the war you know, progress in such a diverse city where you have both Polish citizens and German citizens uh, that have been neighbors and now they are at war. So the story, the story of, of Mrs. Wright is very interesting. We selected only two clips uh, about the beginning, her memories of the beginning of the war and the end of the war. Uh, the pictures that you can see, um, uh, we have now in our collection, we have scans of those pictures. They are from 1950s because this is when uh, Mrs. Uh, Kovacic Wright moved to Warsaw to complete her studies at Warsaw University. Um, so the building you see uh, in the left at the left uh, just hasn't been rebuilt yet. This is it has been destroyed during the war. 85% uh, of Warsaw of the left bank, which is the main side of the city, was destroyed. So it took a while to rebuild it. Uh, so even in the 1950s, early 60s, you could see buildings like that. And then on the right side, we have uh, the Palace of Culture and Science. And I put it in here because um, it was our gift from Stalin. Uh, you know, after World War II, Poland became one of the satellite countries of Soviet Union. And kind of to remind us who our true friend is, um, Stalin gifted Poland uh, the palace that is right in the city center. You cannot miss it when you're in Poland. So it's in Warsaw. So it's a very interesting picture because it shows the palace when it was still very bright. And now it's much, much darker, you know, over the years, pollution, and all of that uh, made the color change a lot. So those are two really interesting photographs from Mrs. Um, Kovacic Wright. And now we can play the clip. Yeah, and also that the Palace of Culture and Science, it looks very similar to a bunch of buildings that you would see throughout the Soviet Union. Yes, it's the, the very it's common style. Very common. Uh, there, I believe it's called the Eighth Sister. There is a series of seven, seven sisters, which is the seven uh, buildings that look like that. And it was built, it was designed by a Soviet engineer, architect. Uh, believe it or not, it was based on American Art Deco style. Ooh. So it's very interesting how um, it's Soviet. It's very, very significantly Soviet, but it also <laughs> has this American uh, part in, uh, in, in the design. Yeah. All right. So we're going to start off in 39. That, is, uh, that goes back to, say, the 30s. 39, I remember... Now that I remember, we were in, we lived in Cheshire and the war broke out. I didn't know I was, what, four years old. And uh, I remember my mom and I, we took a walk. My sister was sick, so she was at home and we had to get to the drugstore to get some medications for her. And I remember we walked along the street and there was the, somewhere they were building trenches. So I asked my mom, what were they doing? And she says, well, you know, the war broke out. So we need the trenches. I had no idea what that, but that, that's what I saw. Then that was 1939. So also interesting, uh, similar to Cranston's story about Pearl Harbor, um, this Margot story about the start of the war when she remembers the start of the war is tied up in the story of going to the pharmacy. You know, you, you also do these same kind of things like when I think about a memorable historical moment in my life, 
let's say, uh, I mean, the easiest one out of my age would be 9-11. I think about the fact that I was in um, Spanish class and would have been like second or third period in high school. That's so whenever I would tell that story, if somebody was interviewing me about that, I would talk about being in Spanish class and having somebody come in and talk about it uh, and say, you know, she interrupted my teacher and said, oh, there, somebody ran a plane into one of the Twin Towers. So, you know, it is very tied up in your personal history. This isn't just recollecting and t talking about these historical events. They're also how they intersect with you personally. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, nobody stops us and tell us be careful because tomorrow a historical <laughs> event is going to happen <laughs> yes, and sure. uh you know kind of when we when we live it's natural but then as historians as researchers when we look at the past when we look at events that happened uh 100 years ago uh 50 years ago you know we expect people to to give us this testimony of the event itself but they were just living their lives. This is how, mm -hmm. as we live our lives right now, and we don't know that maybe today something historical is happening, but all we're going to remember is that Dan and I had lunch and learn, and it was his birthday, and we're hopefully going to have a good lunch, and, mm -hmm. you know, this is what we're probably going to remember about today. Um, so before we play the second part, uh, another interesting thing, you know, when we record the oral histories, we all, always try to have everything, uh, you know, very well prepared. Sometimes things may happen. And in the second clips, you're going to hear that there is a phone call in the background. Uh, unexpected. Uh, Mrs. Kovacic wasn't expecting it. Uh, so unfortunately, there's going to be the sound, but uh, the, um, the words are very clear. So it's not, it shouldn't bother too much. It, it was probably somebody telling her that she had an extended car warranty available. That is very possible. <laughs> probably. If I remember correctly, it was a telemarketer, so. Most likely. And uh, I remember 45, uh, we were out uh, in the yard that was in our backyard. And I remember those planes. We looked up, Mother says, American planes, they are flying over to to hit the uh, factories in Czechoslovakia. Okay, okay, and then, uh, well, we heard the bombing. Then I remember the, sh the, the, the shrapnel, Mother, I went out with my doll, and here I hear the ooh, and it hit something. I ran instead of, they should have told me, when you hear something like that, get on the floor, you know, get on the ground, but I didn't. Nothing happened, but they hit the church not far from where we lived. Then I was playing the piano once, and I heard that too. I fell off the chair. So I was really afraid. Now, that's when the war ended. The war was coming to a close. The front was coming near us. It was like 60, I think it was 60 kilometers away from Cheshire. And um, my neighbors downstairs said, you better move down, don't stay up on the second floor. So um, I remember I slept under the window, on the floor and under the window. And then I heard, I heard something blew off and I was covered with glass. So the window blew away and of course all the glass was on top of me. That's the only thing I remember from the end of the war. And then the Soviets, when the Soviets came. So then she has a, an ex, a significantly longer story about the Soviets coming and um, everything. But unfortunately, like we said at the beginning, this is not going to be 15 hours long. So yes, I cannot. Uh, and uh, I, maybe I should have, uh, since it's the, um, we, we mentioned um, those are stories of our uh, Central Florida residents. Uh, Margo moved to United States in 1960s and then moved to Florida in 1980s, uh, 83, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so since 83, Margo is our Central Florida resident. And uh, I think this is, this is really beautiful about our community here that we're so diverse and people come here from all over the world and they bring their memories. So instead, in terms of talking about, um, you know, collective memory of us as Floridians, we have to take into consideration all those family histories that people bring with them. 
And uh, the next clip, it's going to be uh, also very interesting. Uh, we actually have a um, video. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kimlat, Boris Kimlat, he uh, also moved to Central Florida in the uh, early 1990s, right after the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, he was born um, in 47, so right after the war. He was born in Azerbaijan. Uh, however, his parents are both uh, Ukrainian Jews. So he, uh, so it's a very fascinating story, not only of a family from Ukraine, but also uh, a Jewish family from Ukraine that survived the war. And in this clip, he is uh, sharing, um, he's showing medals that his parents uh, got from, for fighting. Uh, his mom was a partisan. Uh -huh. During the war, his father was also in the army fighting uh, Nazis. And yeah, let's let's play Mr. Kimlet. And if I remember correctly, his father was a lifelong Red Army soldier, or did I get that wrong? Um, I believe so. Yes, he fought yeah. for. Uh, he was born in Odessa, and uh -huh. he fought for for Odessa for his hometown for what he was awarded. And I believe we're going to see. Um, yeah. the, uh, it's probably the best to just play the clip. I'll just play the clip and stuff. Remembering, unfortunately, Boris is not here today. I checked the participant list. Yes, but... Top is my father. Mm -hmm. This is Red Star. It was a sign in very for individual sums, not for group or celebration. No, so it was most popular but at the same time very honorable side and this is it's what you ask me mm -hmm. where my father fight it uh, it's just military generally next is let me read them I turn it the Barono Odessa means fighting for his own city Odessa mm -hmm. Yeah. This is my mom. And this is very honorable medal for bravery, personal bravery. Mm -hmm. Being partisan, she was young, she was born in 1921, so at the time of the war she was 20. Yeah. Yes. So it was very honorable. And this is medal. This, this also got it was medal uh, 1945 celebrating victory in World War II. So I keep them for my memory. Um, and then next we have some photos going to be honest, the same thing as the previous audio clip where we say, unfortunately, you can't go back, do them again. If I could, we would have taken photos of each of these individual ones, but we didn't bring a, a camera. So got I got to slap myself in the back of the hand for that one. But um, so he's going to talk about some photos that I, these are from both of his parents as well. Okay, we're back. Oh, wow. It's partisans. This so picture. this is where your mom was. Yes. Um, this picture was done in 1940. Let me know if, you can, yep, that's if good. the camera yeah. can see. Yeah, I can. That's amazing. Uh, do you know where your mom is over there? or? No, it's, in, it's, it's invisible. It's too many. Uh, yes. But this is your mom, right? Yes. Here. She's oh. sitting. Wow. <laughs> Okay. And you can see. Okay. A lot of them have, uh, you can see a lot of them have German guns. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Schmeisser. Mm. Yep. Yep. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Huh? So that's his uh, mom. Oh, and this is it's mom. With the 
you can see on the back, January 1943. My father and his brother, older brother, two years older than him. So your father is to the right, is the one on the right, this is your father? Yes. And the left is his brother? Yes. Typical Soviet situation. My father in his office, and I don't see date, but it uh -huh. 40s, 1940s. Stalin small boost and big one in the corner. <laughs> small statue on the table. You you okay. have to have him in front of you and behind you. You know, yeah, anywhere you, anywhere you look. I love the lamp. Oh yeah. This is very special. It's my mom, older brother, mm. and on the back of the picture, May 1945, Prague. Oh, because okay. it was uh, days after German capitulation. Mm -hmm. mm, uh, May 9. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... 9 or 10. Uh, victory day. Yeah. So yeah. again, uh, I have to say. Yeah. In terms of uh, preservation, we usually try to um, bring the pictures in, uh, scan them. It's like a separate process, oral history. We had just done this interview with uh, Mr. Kimlet recently uh, during the pandemic, and <laughs> we mm. we haven't really had a chance to to do our normal processing of uh, how we do things. We're just slowly coming back to normal uh, operations here. Um, so hopefully we'll have better um, better quality pictures um, later. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very interesting, uh, especially when we talk about uh, memories from the Eastern Front. Um, you know, a lot of individual stories wrapped up in a big uh, military history. Uh, you know, um, Mr. Kimlet's father fighting for his own city, his mom, um, a partisan, um, Ukrainian partisan fighting with uh, with the Nazis, and. Um, now, Mr. Kimlet is, is part of our community. He has been here for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and uh, we, we interviewed his son as well, or Alexandra interviewed her, his son as well. And, you know, I'm sure that he has his own stories to tell about life in the Soviet Union, which is now part of our collection and, you know, the tapestry of what, it, what Central Florida memory is. Um, so, uh, Alexandra is going to talk about for yeah, basically um, for further reading or further interest. for further yes for for widening your interest uh collecting oral histories is very popular uh especially in the countries that experienced uh, significant losses in world war ii uh it is very 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 popular way of collecting uh stories not all of the countries have collections that are available um to English speakers, uh, you know, we couldn't find uh, many, uh, but I, be I believe like I couldn't find any big collection in France, for example, but I, I don't believe that there isn't any. I think that uh -huh. it's just maybe not as popular as the ones that we selected from the bigger ones. Uh, Poland, of course, uh, Poland has the big collection uh, um, collected by the History Meeting House. That's that's actually the place where where I used to uh, work before. And even though interviews themselves are mostly in Polish um, and the same about the other projects, like we have the memory of nations here, I believe the interviews themselves are pretty much in Czech or you know the, the native language of people who are in being interviewed. However, the collection itself is pretty well described in English. So even though, mm -hmm. You may not understand the interview, but they, there is a big collection of pictures that is described in English. It's accessible online. So uh, there is a lot of content uh, besides just the story. So we have the Polish uh, archive. We have the Czech archive, a huge archive of the Holocaust survivors uh, and just generally stories related to the Jewish um, 
communities all, all over Europe. Uh, Yad Vashem in uh, Jerusalem in Israel. And this is very well, very well archived and very well described, very accessible online. Um, there is the Russian one. Uh, Dan, do you want to talk yeah. about? So I used uh, some of these interviews for my thesis. Uh, so they are available in English because my Russian is uh, probably by this point non-existent, but was even terrible at the time. Uh, so uh, they do have some in English, but I told Alexandra about it three weeks ago, and basically since then it's been down. So I don't, it's run by the State Archives of Russia. Uh, so it's a, I don't, it's kind of surprising that they would abandon such a project. Uh, and I've checked it, it's intermittently been back up. Uh, if you are really interested, it does have full transcripts in English. Uh, so it is one of the few sources that is just fully available in English. Um, obviously, there are full collections available in Russian. Um, they did not do any interviews in any language but Russian. So they've just translated some of them. Uh, they interviewed Uzbeks, Tajiks, uh, people from Chechnya, like, you know, throughout what was Soviet Union's territory, but the interviews were done solely in Russian. Uh, and then they've been translated. Some of them have been translated in English. So if you're really interested, I hope it's back up soon. I don't really know what the deal is. So I'm sorry. I, I wish I had a definitive news for you. But yes, but it is, is it is a good source. So hopefully they will figure out yeah. whatever they need to do with the website uh, to, to put it back yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, and then domestically, um, the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project is not just for World War II, it's for all veterans, uh, but when it was started, it prioritized World War II veterans. So there's a ton of World War II uh, stories there. The National World War II Museum in New Orleans, which cannot recommend enough uh, for you to go see, and also they have an online exhibit. And then in the state of Florida, there is us, obviously, but I feel like we've talked about our collection pretty well. University of Florida also has one through their Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. So, uh, and that's also just a smattering. Um, like Alexandra said, for international. Neither of us speaks Chinese, Japanese, or any of the uh, Southeast Asian languages, but I'm sure that they also have uh, have oral history programs and projects about um, their countries during the war, just like I'm sure a number of states throughout the U.S. basically all have one about their World War II history. So I hope that was interesting for you guys. Obviously, this was only an hour to cover you know, um, a four year long war that engulfed the entire planet in war and killed uh, over, I think it's over 40 million people, over 50 million people. Um, so obviously this is a real smattering. We tried to talk about Florida history. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, the Holocaust Museum is also a great resource. Uh, sorry, Irene, you should have said the Holocaust Museum uh, as well, but yes, excellent resource ton of oral histories locally. Um, and that's our emails. If you have anybody that you think uh, could add their story to our collection, either about World War II, about their military service, about life in Florida, it could just be about their lives in Central Florida during the wartime, like, uh, like Dorothy Segul. She was not a veteran, but she talked about um, life in Central Florida for her husband, who was a veteran, or um, Boris didn't serve in the war either, but he talked about his parents' military service. So if there's anybody who uh, you think could add to our collection, we would love to speak with them. Yeah, and so. uh, the, Dan mentioned Boris. Uh, this is the thing with, you know, um, as time flies, a lot of people uh, that survived the war unfortunately pass away. It's just been mm -hmm. a really long time ago. And now we, uh, we have to rely on the stories of their children. Uh, a lot of people feel very modest and they, they think that, you know, they didn't really survive that much. So they, they, they don't think they have interesting stories to share, but if they will not share it with us, the stories of their parents, grandparents uh, is not going to get preserved. So that's why we rely uh, more and more on the second generation uh, mem memories, uh, because it's just the nature of, of history that, you know, people pass away. Um, but yeah, if if any of you know, or if any of you have um, memories of your parents, we we always appreciate uh, new contacts. 
Yeah, like uh, I think an example, at least from my personal life, is my uh, my grandfather was a photographer on B-17s bombing Japan. Uh, and he never talked about the war. He mentioned some very brief things about the occupation. Nobody knew what he did during the war until he passed away and we found his DD-214, which is a little form that the Department of Defense gives you when you leave the service. Uh, so we didn't know what medals he'd won. He was a marksman in a bunch of different weapons. Um, he ended up using photography throughout his entire life. We had no idea that he learned that in the service. Um, so, you know, we one, if you know anybody who experienced this firsthand, we'd love to speak to them and anybody who feels like they could share a family story. So does anybody have any questions uh, about uh, I don't know, World War II in Florida, oral history program, anything. Uh, feel free to ask. If Also, if you don't feel like asking in the chat, um, that's our email addresses. Um, so please email us. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Some people said it was interesting. Yeah. We, we certainly hope that you spend uh, a valuable hour with us. <laughs> And that you learned something and uh, that um, that you enjoyed. Yeah, this was a this was a fun program to put together. Uh, like I like we mentioned, both Alexander and I have, uh, you know, an interest in World War Two, I think. I mean, that sounds that sounds weird to say, but I've always had like a research interest in World War Two. Um, so it was nice to kind of put together this and talk about uh, where we work and uh, where we live. Uh, during that time too. So I um, guess if nobody has any questions, then uh, and we're just gonna, yeah, they're just we're just gonna thank you once yep. again uh, so much uh -huh. for spending this afternoon with us. And um, again, these are our emails. Don't hesitate to email us. Uh, even if you if it doesn't have to be World War II history, because we, we were so <laughs> focused on World War II in this program, but we collect uh, we have a lot of different collections. Uh, and uh, we just generally collect stories of Central Florida. So it's Orange County and every county around it, a uh, total of seven counties, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, we have a collection of the theater scene in Central Florida, um, uh, local artists, general stories, uh, veterans, of course. So any, any interesting hey. histories. We and also uh, regional histories, like we have been uh, interviewing people in Oakland, uh, Florida, out by Ocoian Winter Garden, if nobody is uh, familiar. Um, you know, we've done uh, history of African Americans locally. We have a collection on South Apopka. Um, we've done uh, segregated schools and uh, closed school. We interviewed teachers from Grand Avenue, which was a former school that closed to give way to the ACE. Uh, so if there's a part of local history that you think needs to preserve and somebody who's experienced it firsthand, we'd love to talk to them about it. Okay. Thank so you. thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to stop the share and then end the webinar. So again, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to message us.